Hello and welcome to Sonder. My name is Maggie. I am a knitter, sewist, bibliophile, and new doctor living here in Denver, Colorado. Um, man, I almost feel like I need to change that a little bit. Um, I've always said that I'm a new doctor because I started my residency last year, but I am now officially a second year resident and no longer an intern, which is crazy and feels really good. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, I am doing a residency here in Denver, Colorado in internal medicine and pediatrics, so a joint residency. And um, I have this little corner of the internet where I get to hang out with a bunch of like-minded people and talk about books and crafting, mostly. Um, but I also use this as a journal to keep track of the things that have been going on in my life, and um, it's been crazy. <laughs> um, I finished up working in the medical ICU, or the MICU as we call it, um, and that was a really, really challenging month. It was really amazing in a lot of ways, and I became a much, much better doctor for working there, and I think honestly probably became a better human for working there as well and just helping connect with patients who are patients and their families as they go through the most challenging experience of their lives. So it was a really beautiful but really um, sad and challenging month. And then right after that, I had a vacation. So um, I got to go on vacation. I went to San Diego, California, and I will put in at the end of the vlog, as I always do, um, some footage from the beach and things like that. I honestly did not take very much footage. I am the kind of person who like, when I am on vacation, I feel like I am very connected with what is happening in the now. And it's really hard for me to remember to like, pull out my phone and shoot some footage. So I did um, did take some footage of some really beautiful sunsets that we saw as well as some um, tide pooling that we went. So we went and looked at some tide pools, which as someone who like grew up in the um, mountain west, tide pools are not something that I really get to look at that often. So it was really cool to see all the little crabs and critters um, in the tide pools. Um, and then after that, we started, I switched back to pediatrics. So every three months I go back and forth between adult medicine and pediatric medicine. And now I'm back on the pediatric wards at Children's Hospital Colorado. And I'm in the palm unit, which is so fun. <laughs> um, on the palm unit, we have a lot of really complex kiddos. So a lot of kiddos with tracheostomies um, and vent and vent requirements. So essentially that means that they have a little hole in their neck about right here. And um, that connects to a machine that kind of breathes through them through that um, hole. And it's been really fun. I mean, I think that the thing that's so amazing about kids is that even when things are a little bit harder and they're going through something hard and they're in the hospital and a little bit sick or very sick, they're still just so playful and interactive and silly. Um, I've gotten to learn a lot of sign language. So um, when kiddos are trach vent dependent, meaning that they have a trach and they're requiring the machine to breathe for them, they uh, unfortunately can't speak with their voice um, unless the, the trach itself is capped. So unless they're like breathing on their own. Um, and so a lot of the kiddos on our uh, service use sign language to speak, which Honestly, a lot of babies in the United States and I'm sure elsewhere use sign language because it's much more, it's much easier to um, make rudimentary signs and be able to communicate your needs with your hands rather than speaking with your voice. And so um, 
I've learned a lot of sign language. I already knew a lot of baby sign language, but I've learned a lot more baby sign language, specifically animal focus. Um, so we have a couple little kids who really, really love animals and like to go through all of their animals. And so I've learned, um, and truthfully, like I've learned all of these signs from infants. And so if they're wrong, I'm sorry, but I just wanna go through them because they're so cute. Um, so what all have I learned? I've heard dog, I've learned dog, which is um, just sort of tapping your hip. Cat, uh, bear, uh, giraffe, <laughs> uh, elephant, um, guinea pig, bird. Um, what else have I learned? Um, dinosaur. Um, yeah, it's so fun. It's just been so silly. And I think for, for me, I love adult medicine because I really love the, um, connection that you can make with adult patients and the conversations you can have and the really beautiful experiences that you can have. Um, yeah. And I certainly got a lot of that uh, while I was in the NICU, um, but I love being able to switch back after three months into pediatrics and hanging out with kids who are just silly and resilient and playful, even when they're sick. And it's just so fun. They're just so cute and wily and silly. And um, yeah, it's bringing me a lot of joy to be back on the, the kiddo side of things back in pediatrics. Um, so yeah. That's kind of all I've been doing. Um, I Right now I'm on kind of a hard month, so we work uh, something called Q4 call, which means that every four days we work a 24 to 28 hour shift. So it's a long one. And um, I work another one of those shifts tomorrow, so thought I would come on here and uh, record today and just sort of connect with you guys. I've really missed you. It's been... Um, really strange to take a few weeks off and I've actually like missed being able to connect and talk about the things that we're all doing depending on if that's making something or reading something so I'm just really happy to be back and to say hi again. Um, I, re I literally just got out of the shower so my hair is still wet and wild. Um, one thing that I have started doing, which has been really beautiful for me, is I've started exercising again, which is something that I used to do a lot of. I used to do a lot of mountain biking, trail running, um, skiing, and I feel like I, I definitely still skied quite a bit this year. I think I got like close to 30 days of skiing in this year, um, but I really have not been exercising for a year. Um, I think some people, when they went into COVID, they started exercising more and focusing more on their sort of self-care. And I was kind of in the opposite of that, where I was really, for the last year, I would say, I was surviving and not necessarily thriving. Um, and I'm really just trying to thrive now. I'm really trying to focus more on the things that are good for me and my mental health and one of those things is exercise and so actually in the last week I have gone on two different trail runs which here in Denver you know I can be in the mountains on a trail run um, in the woods in the mountains in like a 15 minute drive from where I live in the city that's not the same for everyone who lives in the city but um, I live in northwest Denver and so it's really easy for me to jet up to the mountains and Oh, I have just been finding so much joy and um, solace in my ability to start running again. And it is hilarious because I used to run like trail half marathons and um, used to very easily just go out and run nine miles. And now I'm like, I ran three miles today and I felt really proud of myself for that. So, you know, I'm definitely starting back but it's good to start again and just know that it's it's good that I'm getting out and I'm running and I'm making myself feel better so yeah it's been feeling really good to to exercise a little bit more and that's why I just went on the trail run so I just 
quickly came back, took a shower, and here I am chatting with you. Um, I am, you'll see me drinking a couple of different things. One thing that I'm drinking is this uh, homemade kombucha that I have here. It is strawberry passion fruit flavor and it is delicious, but a little bit too, sh too sour. Like I let it go just a little bit too long, but it still tastes good to me. And then I also just have a bubbly water, but I might put that down here. Um, so. I've been gone for a very long time and have a lot of crafting content to talk about. Um, so let's just start from the top here. Um, I wanted to show this sock off. So I took part in a um, mystery skein uh, club where you got a new skein of yarn for three months in a row and it was based off of the American West. Um, it was through Tuscan Knits. Um, this is their ball band and it's on the fuzz base, which is 55% superwash merino, 20% mohair, and 25% nylon. And I really, really love this base. So it came with one skein of yarn three months in a row and I'm planning on just turning them into socks. And I think they're perfect skeins for socks. Um, the first one is called Way Out West. Actually, I think this is the most recent one to come, but the first one that I'm gonna tell you about is called Way Out West. So beautiful. The second is Sagebrush, Sagebrush Trail, which I really, really love this one. It's so beautiful. And then the third one is probably my favorite, um, and that's because this is actually my favorite, or inspired by my favorite wild flower. And that is the Indian paintbrush, which is this really beautiful um, orange flower. And this is the beautiful yarn that was dyed up. And it's really, really complex. I really love it. And I think if you have ever seen an Indian paintbrush, um, then you'll know this you'll recognize this. It's a very distinct orange, red, yellow mix. And I have immediately when I got this, I wound it into a ball and immediately cast it on into a sock, even though I have this other languishing wick whip sock in here, which I will finish, but I just got too excited about this. Um, so this is just a sock that was actually inspired by one of my coworkers. She was wearing a ready to wear sock that was a two by two rib. And then it looked like the bottom half of the sock was like the sock that's sort of part of the sock that's around the foot was reverse stockinette. Like that's just what it looked like. And I saw it on her foot one day and I was like, I like that a lot. And so I made this into that. So it's a really simple, essentially vanilla sock where I just did a two by two rib and then my go-to heel flap and gusset and then the rest of the sock is just in reverse stockinette and for me I feel like this is a really I, I like socks for having things that are really simple and so for me it's essentially just a vanilla sock that has a little something else going on I would honestly really like to knit a couple more lace socks and socks that have just a little bit more going on because I love having those. I have one pair of lace socks that is probably my favorite pair of socks in my entire arsenal of socks. And I love to wear it, but it took me forever to knit. And I think while I would like to have more of those sort of textured, beautiful socks, it's just in general, not what I use sock knitting for. So but I really love this color. It's so beautiful. So yeah, that is my first thing that I wanted to talk about. And then the next thing I'm very, very excited about. Um, this is my bouquet sweater by Junko Okamoto, um, and this is this really beautiful all over color work sweater, and I finished the body. Crazy. Um, here it is. I am absolutely obsessed with this sweater. Um, yeah, it's amazing. 
So I knit this out of um, Brooklyn Tweed Shelter in two different colorways. One is the um, Hayloft colorway, which is this yellow color. And then the background color is their new spring color. And I feel like it gets lost a little bit. Like the, I feel like the uh, motif gets lost just a little bit because it's so busy and so much is going on. But I feel like I'm gonna wear this all the time. I'm obsessed. Um, my personal favorite flower is actually on the back. It's this one. I don't know why, I don't know what it's based off of, but I am obsessed with this flower. Um, this was a challenge and I am really excited to cast on the sleeves and knit those and get this knitted up and ready for the winter. But I think it's gonna have to wait for a little bit because it is so warm. This yarn is, um, for those of you who don't know, I, like this is a really famous American um, company, but Brooklyn Tweed is a um, worsted spun yarn um, that is worsted weight as well. And so having this on my lap when it's like 95 degrees outside is just too much. So it will probably have to kind of go on the back burner until the end of summer, early fall, but it's kind of fun to have it be this far along and know that in early fall, I'll be able to just pick it up, cast on the sleeves, finish the sleeves and be done with this like really, really beautiful sweater that I think will be a really comfortable um, and frequently worn sweater in the fall and winter. So I'll just put it on really quickly. It's hard because I obviously like have not blocked it at all, but it's going to be a little bit cropped and pretty boxy, um, pretty oversized, but I think that it is something that I am going to wear all the time. I'm picturing like some like high-waisted mom jeans and it's going to be incredible. <laughs> um, so yeah, this, I learned so many new techniques. I almost feel like I should make a video that's like just about this sweater in particular because Man, oh man, I learned a lot. I've learned so, so much. I think that this is totally doable for someone who has knit at least one sweater before. The directions are really straightforward and there's only one size, but I think the thing that is so challenging about it is that it's a very different kind of color work in terms of the stitches being really separated from each other. There were times at which I had like, almost 50 stitches between the two colors and so it made it pretty challenging because I had to learn ladder back to card which I've already talked about and then um, just the fact that it's an asymmetrical chart makes it challenging because normally when you're doing color work it's like a very repetitive chart and that is not at all the way this is this is totally its own thing so I did just want to show you what the ladder back to card looks like now that I have finished the sweater. Um, so you can see here, all of this. Here's another great example. All of this, which, so for example, right here, you know, it's from here to here, there's no color on this side. So it's, you know, close to 30 stitches and the ladder black jacquard technique was amazing. I feel like you really cannot see on the front the contrast color poking through. It was just really incredible. And I think this will block out really beautifully so that it lays flat and yeah, I love it. I love it. So yeah, this will probably go into a little bit of a summertime hibernation and I will pull it out again when I can withstand it being on my lap because that is not right now. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is actually in this very special bag, which I will discuss shortly. But this was a cast on that I cast on right before I went to San Diego. So about two weeks ago, and it was the thing that I worked on while I was in San Diego and I finished it. <laughs> um, so 
This is, and I literally just cast this off this morning, so literally just finished it, but this is the uh, Lydia tank. Um, and this is a really beautiful tank. I've already knit this once before, but the bottom of it is this really, really beautiful lace motif um, that then just goes into a very simple um, high neck, but with a beautiful V-neck in the back, which I think you can wear it like this um, if you want to. I, I never wear mine like that, but you totally could. Um, so yeah, it's just this really cute little tank top for um, for summer. And I knit this out of a stash uh, cotton, like black cotton DK weight yarn. And I really loved it. It was really exactly what I wanted to work on when I was on the beach. And um, it's great because, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's great because you have the um, awesome beautiful lace motif, which I will block this between now and the next podcast so that you can actually see what the lace looks like when it blooms and opens up a little bit. Um, but you have this really beautiful lace motif that was really, really fun to work. And then you transition into what is akin to essentially just like plain stockinette with some shaping. And um, it is really really well done um i definitely made some mistake like when i was doing the back i don't know what i did but um i definitely made a mistake somewhere and as i was working it i was like suddenly i have way less stitches than i think i should have and so had to sort of fudge it a little bit but no one will ever know but me um so i was like it's fine but yeah i'm really really excited i think having this in black will be really helpful um just like a good addition to my wardrobe and i've been trying to knit more things that i can wear in the summertime because it gets really hot here in denver and so having some some things in my wardrobe that i can wear year round are really really useful sorry i'm very dehydrated from my three mile run this morning. Um, the next thing that I started knitting on, which this is, I'm not, I'm not sure. I feel like you guys need to help me. Um, so I have a couple different sweater quantities of the um, Quince & Co Sparrow, which is 100% uh, linen yarn. And it's really, really beautiful. But I just don't know how to knit with it. It's really bizarre. So I cast on for this t-shirt, which I'm really, really excited about, but it's just gonna be so open. And I just don't think that's what I want. It's a little bit hard to show off because it's on this crazy magic loop situation. I was like on the plane trying to figure this out, but I just, I just don't know. I just don't know. So anyway, this is a little bit of a tale of woe. I think honestly, what I might do is hold it double and knit it DK or I don't know if you guys have a really nice, like summery top that's already knit with linen yarn. I think that would be helpful because this sweater that I'm trying to knit, I can't remember the name of, but I will try to put up a picture. Um, is so beautiful and I think it's something that I definitely want in my wardrobe it's a really cute t-shirt but I just don't think that this is the right yarn for that project and so I have I think two different sweater quantities two different colors of this same yarn and I would really like to get some use out of it but I just don't know what it wants to be so I don't know if you guys have any um great sweater or sorry, great sort of summer tops that have been knit out of this type of yarn, please let me know because I can't figure it out. I'm, I just, I feel like I've knit with cotton yarn, but for whatever reason, the linen yarn is just something that I don't understand. Um, okay, the next thing I'm going to talk about is some sewing that I have been doing. So let me actually reach up and grab this beautiful thing that's hanging right here. This is um, a dress that I just finished sewing um, right before I went to San Diego. 
and was um, a great, has been a great addition to my wardrobe. I've worn it a lot. Um, this is the Hallen dress and it is this really beautiful, I would say like T-length, almost maxi length dress that has a really beautiful scallop around the hem and then a low back that also has some um, kind of, I don't know what you call this, ruching? I don't know. Uh, that has this kind of ruffling effect in the back. Um, and yeah, this is a really light cotton voile. And so it is just so, so comfortable to wear. It looks super cute. It's high waisted in the front and then the back, obviously very low back, but it just is so comfortable. And I have really, really been enjoying wearing it during these hot, hot summer days. And then, um, so um, the next thing that I want to talk about are these project bags that I've made. Um, so these project bags were made out of a bunch of fat quarters that I got at Fancy Tiger Crafts, which is my local craft store. And essentially it was just free form quilting, which was really, really fun. Um, and yeah, I really wanted to kind of frame this motif and then just put the um, fabric around it just however I wanted. And I really, really loved how it turned out. So the front um, of all of the project bags are this, I forget what this is called, maybe like log cabin or something like that. It, but anyway, the front are this motif and then the backs are all squares that have been cut in a very random way. And then I've put some interfacing and they're all lined with this um, linen yarn and I have just loved using this. This was the only product bag that I brought with me to um, San Fran or sorry to San Diego and it's surprisingly big. When I was making it, I did not expect it to be quite this big. So um, it fits like two to three skeins of yarn in it, like almost four skeins of yarn. It's actually like a bigger bag than I was anticipating making. I thought that I would just get some sock bags out of it, but I would say it's more of like a shawl slash like summer garment bag. Um, so yeah, I've been really, really enjoying using it. The bottom is this waxed canvas that is also from Fancy Tiger Crafts. And I just, I had so much fun making these and I'm really excited to have a give you, giveaway for you guys. Um, I know last time I was talking about this, I think I said that I wanted to do a giveaway like once I reached a certain number of subscribers, but truthfully, I know I probably should care about it, but this community has been so beautiful and so fun to meet people and talk about books and knitting and I've just gotten so much joy out of it and already have so many more people coming and joining me every week than I ever thought I would. And so I, that's all just to say that this is really just a journal for me and a way for me to meet friends on the internet. And so I just don't really care about the numbers. And so I would love to have a giveaway. So I have three different bags. Um, I will show them off. This is the first one. And I have this one. And this one I did something a little different on the back. I was just feeling kind of excited. And the third one looks like this. I just, I really, really loved how these turned out. I actually, for Christmas, am really excited about doing something similar to this, but quilting it and making uh, placemats for people for Christmas. I just think that would be an actually like pretty quick and easy gift and would be a lot of fun to be able to put together these motifs. I, I really, really loved it. And I put a lot of like thought and joy and good intentions into these when I was making them. and. My thought is that um, for three lucky winners, I can send you this and then I'll probably put a couple little goodies inside the bag as well. I'm thinking probably a book. I have a lot of books on my shelf that I have really loved but are not going to make it into my forever library. Um, and 
I have some yarn and stuff too. So I don't know, I'll, I'll probably decide on a whim what I decide to put in them, but you'll definitely be getting a bag. Um, so if you want the option to win one of these three bags, what you need to do is um, subscribe to the channel, hit the like, and then leave a comment of the best book that you've read in the last two years your favorite book you've read in the last two years. And I know it's nearly impossible to pick just one, so if you need to put down a few, that's totally fine. But yeah, so if you wanna win one of these bags and whatever goodies I decide to put in them, uh, you need to subscribe, like, and put down in the comments your favorite book that you've read in the last two years. So, all right, that is all of the like completed crafting talk I have to talk about. The only other thing that I was hoping to talk about was to get your guys' opinion on a future work in progress that I really want to cast on probably this fall. So I have this really, really special yarn. This is um, Woolen, which is 80% Fine Merino, 10% Romadale, Romadale? Romadale? I don't know how to pronounce that, and 10% Blue Face Lester, but it's 100% um, Colorado sourced and milled. So this um, yarn is 100% from Colorado, and this is the Melody colorway, which is this really beautiful blue. Um, and I was hoping to knit this. I wish you guys could feel this because it's so soft. This was a um, quite expensive um, yarn that I bought, and I bought four skeins of it. So I definitely have enough to knit a sweater for my size. And I'm hoping to knit this into Emily Foden's, um, uh, what is it called? The soiree sweater in It's About Winter, which is this just like really simple. The front is simple and then it has these really beautiful um, cable details along the sides and I think under the underarm. So I was hoping to knit that and I'm trying to decide what color of um, mohair I want to get to go with this. I think I'm probably going to um, order some mohair from um, from Fiber for the People. I really, really love Fiber for the People's um, different mohairs and they have two or three different colors that I'm thinking of doing. I think I want it to be a little bit contrasting and I'm leaning a little bit more towards um, this really beautiful sage color that they have and I'll put some pictures up here. So I was thinking either this sage color or like a lavender color. I don't know, I haven't decided, but I think that those would add some complexity to the color of this while also just being fun and beautiful. So I don't know, what are your thoughts? Maybe I will also reach out to um, Taylor, who uh, is the dyer of Fiber for the People and sort of owner of that business and see what she thinks too. But sage or lavender? Who, who's to know? Um, so anyway, that's something that I'm thinking about purchasing soon because um, I kind of want this to be my like late summer, early fall cast on. So something that I cast on in like September or October, especially because October is my birth birthday month. And so I really want something beautiful and really special to be knitting on during that month. So I don't know, what are your guys' thoughts? I haven't decided yet. Um. All right, Whew. turns out there's a lot of knitting to discuss when you haven't knitted for, or you haven't podcasted for over a month. But anyway, that is all the crafty talk that I have. And so I'm going to move on to talking about all of the amazing books that I have read in the last month. Whew. All right. Ugh. Just need to crack my back there. <laughs> there's, um... Oh, I have read so many books, like I don't even know where to begin. And so I kind of feel like I'm just gonna go through them as quickly as I can. And I will spend a little bit more time on books that I really, really love. Very similar to a couple months back when I also took a month off and then had way too many books to talk about at once um, to be able to go into any sort of in-depth discussion. 
So I will start by talking about Bringing Down the Duke by Evie Dunmore. This was a reread that I read in the last month and it is just as fantastic as the first time I read it. I love this book. For me, it's like this series is five out of five. It's so good. It's exactly what I want in a romance. This is a kind of slow burn, hate to love romance that follows two people, a duke and a young woman who is going to Oxford. Um, and is going there kind of with a scholarship from the suffragist movement within her community. And so she also is a suffragist and it's just got everything. I mean, it's got the hate to love romance. It's got some steamy sex scenes. It's got some like hard to have make a relationship work because of societal norms, etc. I mean, it's so good. It's really well written. It's fun, it's flirty, it's sexy, it'll get you hot and bothered, it's got it all. I highly, highly recommend Bringing Down the Duke and uh, Rogue of One's Own, both by Evie Dunmore. I cannot wait for her next book to come out. She does an amazing job. Love it, love it, love it. Highly recommend. If you're looking for something fun and something that will just be pure happiness in a book, then look no further. Like, this is so good. The next book that I am going to talk about was a bit of a dud, which I feel a little bit strange talking about this because I feel like everybody is really loving this book right now. That's how the next two books are, to be honest. I'm like, they're fine. Um, this is The Maidens by Alex Michelides. Michelides? I don't know how to pronounce this Greek name, um, sorry. But anyway, this book is um, the second thriller that has been written by this author. The first book that he wrote was The Silent Patient, which I also thought was just okay. So I don't know why I was like so hyped to read this book. Um, but you know what? I like horror. I like thriller from time to time. <clears throat> so I was actually like pretty excited for this book. This book essentially follows a serial killer in, I think, Oxford as well. Um, I can't remember if it's like Cambridge or Oxford, but it's like in England, in one of those like fancy old schools in England. Um, and it follows this serial killer who's murdering the sort of star pupils of this um, professor there. And it's about, it's kind of like dark academia, like murder mystery. And it was just fine. like. I don't know. For me, I like figured out who killed these people really early and the twist was like so out of left field that I was just like, I don't know. Sometimes like I like a twist where I'm like, oh, I didn't think that was going to happen, but I see how you laid the groundwork for that happening throughout the entire book and I just overlooked it. So I don't know. The The twist was like too far out of left field and was like kind of ridiculous and the story was just not that compelling. I don't think any of the characters were that compelling. I actually think that if Alex Michelides would have spent much more time on the, um, the women within this group and the um, attraction to their professor and the professor himself. Like if you would have spent more time kind of building that up, I would have liked it a lot more because I think it's really interesting to kind of learn about the group thing. And I really like dark academia. Like I know that this is at this point, you know, everybody's read this book, but the secret history by Donna Tart, I loved that. And I think it's because it was so beautiful and spent more time with the characters and building the characters up and this was just fine. I think I gave it like a two out of five. It, I didn't, I didn't hate it, but I thought that it could have been a lot better than it was and I was pretty disappointed. Don't hate me. <laughs> so many people have been reading and loving that book. So who am I? I'm just some random woman on the internet. Who am I? Um, and then I'll, I'll keep going with this next book. Um, so I also read One Last Stop by Casey McQuiston. <sighs> okay, I feel like I should preface this by saying that I loved Red, White, and Royal Blue. Like, it was my everything. I've read it twice now. I really, really loved it. It was like one of my favorite. It was honestly like 
probably the romance that got me into romance. Like I didn't know that I liked romance until I read Red, White, and Ro Royal Blue. And I was like, this is what this genre is. Like, this is the fun that can be had while reading a book. This is ridiculous. And so I went into this book with very, very high hopes. This book um, follows two women who meet and it's got this like interesting sci-fi angle to it where essentially you have one character, one of the heroines, um, who has been stuck on this train, on the Q train um, in Brooklyn. I think it's Brooklyn. It's somewhere in New York City, but I think it's Brooklyn. Anyway, she's been stuck on the Q train of the subway since like 1975 or something like that. And it's about her meeting this other woman who kind of comes to the city in hopes of finding herself and like studying, etc. And it's about how they like meet and fall in love. And then it's, you know, got all of the different things that go along with a romance. Um, I honestly, it's hard for me to understand why I don't love this because I thought I was gonna love it and so many people do. I think one of the things is that I am actually a really like hardcore science fiction and fantasy reader. And so I felt like the fact that this had this science fiction and fantasy element in it could have been really cool, but it just was not dealt, like they didn't spend enough time for me to be able to like believe that it was happening or understand like the system, the magic system. Like there just wasn't enough of like an explanation about the science behind it or like the magic behind it. And that to me just, then I was like, well, why is it even in there then? Like why not just have it be like two people who meet on the subway and like have a cute story about them like meeting on the subway and like getting to know one another, etc. So I don't know, I just didn't really like the science fiction aspect to it because I didn't think it was very well done. And I think the other thing that's hard for me is I just don't, this just, this book was not for me in that I do not like the love, or love at first sight trope. Like that is my least favorite trope in all of romance. I like a slow burn, I like people getting to know each other and falling in love because they've gotten to know each other. And this just had like straight up love at first sight. And I just, it's just not for me. However, lots of people really, really loved this book. And so if you have any interest in it at all, I have many friends who read it and absolutely adored it. So you should pick it up if you're interested. I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel like we got the two that I didn't really like that much out of the way. And so now the rest of the books are all great. Okay, the next one I will talk about is the book that I read while I was sitting on the beach in San Diego and it was the perfect book to read for that. It is Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Um, this is the author of Daisy, Joan and the si Daisy Jones and the Six and um, the Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. I will say that The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo is by far her best book, but this is also, I thought, quite good. So this follows the um, Riva siblings, which are siblings who have gone through quite a bit. Um, they have a very famous father, but he kind of abandons them. And it's essentially a book just about them throwing a party and things getting out of hand and their lives and their sort of interactions with one another. So it is definitely like a story about like people who become famous in Malibu. So, you know, like, but they do have some problems. Like their childhood is pretty fraught. They have a mother who has a lot of issues. Um, they end up being kind of orphaned pretty early and having to take care of each other. And so there's actually a lot going on in the story. And I think the thing that I loved the most about it was the character development amongst the sibling relationships. So um, there are four siblings in this group and it was just really beautiful to see them love each other and get mad at each other and learn from each other and grow. And I, I really just enjoyed the journey that we went on with them and it's really not a plot driven story. I think that there are other um, 
other books that are written by Taylor Jenkins Reid in which you're like kind of like building up to this like big thing and I think in some ways that is true because you have this party um, that you're kind of building up to but really what this book is about is four siblings who've had to live through some hard stuff like truly like not you know it's hard but like they're still like white people in Malibu um, so not that hard but like pretty hard um, and it's just about them being siblings and supporting each other and yeah it was great I gave it a three out of five I thought it was you know not the best book that I've ever read it wasn't like earth shatteringly good but it was really enjoyable and very atmospheric and I would say that if you are planning on doing a beach vacation at any point in time in the future that this would be a great one to bring with you especially if that beach vacation involves surfing because obviously there's a lot of surfing in the book the next book I want to talk about was incredible um this is An Unkindness of Ghosts by Rivers Solomon they also wrote The Deep which I read last year and really, really loved. Um, but this follows a young woman uh, named Aster who lives on the lower decks of what is essentially a spaceship um, that is organized very similar to Antebellum South. And it is about, it is a like really amazing sci-fi journey about um, Aster kind of living and surviving in this really, really harsh climate. And um, I don't want to give anything else away other than that, because I think that you should really go into it just kind of with the journey. Um, I really enjoyed this. It is really beautifully written. The science is interesting. I ended up giving it a three to four out of five. I didn't love the ending. Um, and for me, I'm just a sucker for an ending. And so because I didn't absolutely love that, I couldn't give it a five out of five, but I did really, really enjoy this and highly recommend it. It's a great um, kind of fan, it's a great sci-fi story that has a lot of really interesting character development. There is a very um, diverse set of characters. So there are people of all different genders, of different races, different backgrounds. Um, and it brings just a lot to the the story itself. Um, I'll just read the back because I think it's actually like describes it so perfectly without giving too much away. And I'm just, I'm finding it hard to describe it because I don't want to give anything away because I think so much of this story is experiencing the journey and kind of going along this ride, which is crazy. Um, okay. Aster has little to offer folks in the way of re rebuttal when they call her ogre and freak. She used to she's used to the names she only wishes there was more truth to them if she were truly a monster she'd be powerful enough to tear down the walls around her until nothing remains of her world aster lives in the low deck slums of the hss matilda a space vessel organized much like the antebellum south for generations matilda has ferried the last of humanity to a mythical promised land on its way, the ship's leaders have imposed harsh moral restrictions and deep indignities on dark-skinned sharecroppers like Aster. Embroiled in a grudge with a brutal overseer, Aster learns there may be a way to improve her lot if she's willing to sow the seeds of civil war. It's, it's good. It's very good. I highly recommend it. It was incredible. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about is The Switch by Beth O'Leary, which essentially is a fun romance that follows two main characters. One is a like grandmother and one is a young woman and they decide to switch their lives and um, one of them goes to live in London and then the other one, the grandmother goes from her like small cottage community to live in London. And then the granddaughter in London goes to live in her grandmother's house in this small cottage. And it's about them, you know, falling in love, etc. And it was really fun. I actually, the thing that I liked most about this book was the um, grandmother's journey. I just really loved hearing more about that. And I think that there are not enough um, romance novels about older people. And so I really enjoyed the grandmother granddaughter interactions, particularly because I um, was very close with my grandmother before she died. And so it was just really fun to be able to learn a little bit more about 
or just to kind of delve into their lives a little bit and, and spend a little bit of time with two people who are flawed but love each other very deeply and are um, looking to have some fun. So yeah, I liked it. I gave it, I think, a three out of five. Which means that this would probably be a four out of five. Like, if I'm giving that a three out of five, this is a four out of five, like, for sure. Um, the next book that I will talk about is another four out of five, and this is The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. This is a really fun, also kind of sci-fi fantasy-esque novel. But I think it's found just under the, like, fiction section. Um that essentially follows this woman who decides to commit suicide. So there's definitely um, trigger warnings for suicidality. Um, and in her sort of purgatory or like space between life and death, she is brought to a place called the Midnight Library in which she is able to read stories about how her life would have turned out if she would have made different decisions. And it's a really honestly like feel good story about kind of loving who you are and where you are and what's going on in your life now. And I really enjoyed it. I thought that it was, it's really, really fast paced. So each chapter is really, really short. And it was just, you know, I think it, it, it gives you a lot to think about in terms of your life and um, having compassion for yourself and where you're at. and. Um, I really enjoyed it. I thought this was great. So um, highly recommend The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. <sighs> okay, I'll talk about my next one and then I'll talk about this last one. Or I guess there are two, three more books, four more books for me to talk about. This is crazy. Um, so the next book that I read was To Love and to Loathe by Martha Waters. And this was very similar to Bringing Down the Duke. Um, it is a kind of hate to lovers, but also like friends to lovers romance um, that takes place in the Victorian era. And it's really fun and silly and um, has some interesting rep in it that I don't want to give away because I actually think the sort of finding out of what's going on with this side character is important to the plot and also interesting and something that I haven't seen in any of these sort of Regency um, romances. So I really loved it. Um, I gave it like a three out of five. It was really fun. So, so sexy. I had a great time reading it. I love all the main characters. Excited to read more from this author. Um, okay, and then this is the last book that I had to talk about that I've actually finished reading. And this was a reread, so you know, whatever. But this is probably my favorite book of all time, and I know I just said that about um, East of Eden, but I think like with rereading these both so soon together, I think this like really does take the cake. Um, and that is Call Me By Your Name by um. Andre Aikman, 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 I'm actually not sure. Um, this is just like the most beautiful book in the entire world and makes me cry every time I read it. And, but also every time I read it, I think I get something different out of it. Um, for those of you who don't know, this follows two young men, um, Oliver and Elio, who Oliver is a um, graduate student who is studying um, sort of like anthropology and history. And he is spending the summer at Elio's home in Italy because Elio's father is a professor. Um, and it is in like the 1980s, maybe early 90s. And it is about these two men and how they fall in love and have a really beautiful but very short-lived love affair over this summer. And it's about two men growing into themselves and finding out more about who they are. And um, it's about the love of a family. It's about making mistakes when you're young. Um, it just, it's so beautiful. And for the fact that it's such a short book, the amount of um, feeling and beauty and connection that is written into these pages is astounding. It is gorgeous and I think like honestly should be required reading for everyone. It is incredible. 
Um, I cannot wait to get a tattoo for this book. I feel like I'm, I'm quickly just jumping on the tattoo train and I think before long I'm gonna have tattoos all over my arms. Um, but I have a lot of different thoughts about what I would want to get um, to kind of pay homage to this beautiful um, novel. But oh my gosh, it's just incredible. I think like there are so many things in this novel when I read it that take my breath away, literally. Like it is that beautiful. And I think like for me, I am, I don't think very pretentious with the reading that I do. I read books from all different genres and um, and this is obviously kind of literary fiction, a modern classic. Um, but I do think that um, with writing there is a higher sort of echelon of authors that truly bring writing into art. Um, and, you know, people would probably say that all of these novels are art, and I think to some degree that's true, but this is like art that will stand the test of time and um, literally takes your breath away and makes you feel things you didn't know that you weren't feeling. It's just beautiful. So anyway, I highly recommend this. I absolutely love it. I usually read it at least once every other year. Um, and the book is just fucking incredible. And the movie is also incredible if you want to watch the movie. Um, okay, the last two books that I have to talk about are the books that I'm reading right now. So one is called The Plot, and I am only a little bit into it, but essentially follows, it's a thriller about a man who, um, he, Ha, he's sort of was an author and is now um, hasn't had a successfully published book in a while and so he is writing a not he's teaching at a sort of creative writing college and he comes across this pupil who is like really arrogant and says you know like I don't really need your help I have the best plot in the world and he's like okay sure whatever and then he hears the plot and it is like truly the most beautiful novel of all time with like a crazy twist, etc. And um, essentially this student dies before he's able to write the book. And so the professor writes the book and then starts having, um, starts getting emails and messages from anonymous sources sort of calling him a thief and a liar. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. So um, I don't really know what's going to happen or where it's going to go. It is pretty enjoyable right now. I don't, I don't know. I haven't found a thriller that I was like, fucking obsessed with in a while. So if you have read any good thrillers lately, please let me know. And then, oh, <laughs> I could not wait any longer to pick up this book. I feel like I waited as long as I possibly could. And then it was just like, what am I gonna read next? All I wanna read in the world is this book. And so I picked it up and that is The Wise Man's Fear, which is the second book in the King Killer Chronicles. Um, the first book is uh, The Name of the Wind, which I just read um, about a month ago. And I just started it like two days ago and I'm already like 200 pages in because I just cannot stop. It's so good, I'm obsessed. I love the characters so much. I'm very invested in the story. The magic system is set up in such a beautiful and easy to digest way. It is a wonderful character-driven fantasy story. I highly, highly recommend you pick it up. And I'm not gonna talk too much more about it because I've already been talking about books forever. Um, it, that is all that I have to talk about today. Um, it was so good to see you guys. Sorry that it was so long since I saw you last. I, I'm trying my best to connect more frequently than I have been, and I'm, I'm really hopeful that this year will be quite a bit easier. Last year was pretty hard. I was impatient for pretty much the entire year, so um, that's a little different this year, and I think that I'll have more bandwidth to connect and craft and read, and yeah, I hope that you guys are enjoying the sunshine. I hope that you are taking some time to see family. I hope that you are healthy and happy. And if you're not, I hope that you're reaching out to people to find help um, because there's a lot of people that love 
each and every one of us out there and um, yeah, take care of yourselves, take care of each other and I'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you.